And welcome back to instead of the Clear Jets podcast, where it's Ben Blessington and Michael Nania. Michael, I don't even know what to say. I don't know how to open this podcast. That was about as nightmarish of a preseason opener as you can get. Uh, and to think the last podcast, we were so excited uh, for this game against the Eagles. And then last night is just a complete fever dream. We waited uh, until uh, Saturday afternoon uh, to record this podcast for obvious reasons we'll get into. Uh, there's a ton to talk about. Because not only did the game have a bunch of storylines, but this week with uh, Becton's injury and, and signing Dwayne Brown, uh, we haven't addressed that on the podcast. So we have a lot to go over tonight. Um, we'll obviously start with, with last night. But before we get into it, Michael, how are you feeling? Uh, one day removed from one of the more scarring preseason memories I, I think I have as a Jets fan. Well, I'm just glad that we held this back to record until today because if, if we recorded it last night I mean we were planning to and I was all ready to just come on here and start ranting about our you know how bad our luck is and the football gods and all the terrible terrible things they try to make us Jets fans deal with but fortunately, like, like Ross Tucker yes yes that is definitely one of the most di- probably more difficult challenge than, you know, waiting for Zach Wilson's health. No, that's an exaggeration, but, uh, but we will get into Ross Tucker later on, but, uh, but yeah, it, it was definitely good to, you know, kind of just sit back, let the medical process play itself out. And uh, luckily we got some good news. Obviously it would be better to not have this at all, but um, you know, with the way that injury looked being non-contact um, just the awkwardness of it, it, it had ACL written all over it. Um, you know, a lot of internet doctors wanted to declare it immediately, but um, fortunately we got some good news and the season can, for the most part, proceed as, you know, as intended, you know, maybe he'll miss a game or two, but uh, looking at how it could have gone, you know, we can put up with that for now, but um, I'm glad that this is, you know, we got this positive news, not just for Zach Wilson's health, of course, but also so we could actually analyze this game because like you said, we were looking forward to it. There was a lot of storylines to track in this game and uh, you know, watching this game live after that injury, it was hard for me to really focus on or process anything at all. I was kind of just zoned out and uh, I, I frankly was not paying much attention, but you and I rewatched this game uh, before we started recording this every single play. And uh, now I feel like I have a good understanding of what happened. Uh, And there were a lot of interesting takeaways. So now that we have that peace of mind, we could sort of analyze this game uh, and move forward. So luckily, uh, the football gods smiled upon us this time. I mean, it would have been nice if they didn't do this at all, but at least we got this. Yeah. At the time of recording this, because the the Jets have... Uh, they, the, the, the whole Becton situation has scared the Jets from coming out and being completely optimistic. And they've, they've been off on a few timetables. Uh, even Wilson's own injury last year, remember it was only supposed to be a few weeks. And then it's like, he's missing the Bills games and the Dolphins game. And then, you know, he doesn't return until Houston. Uh, I think the Jets are trying to be cautious with the timeline they give Jets fans. Um, so they have released like, you know, we have to see after the knee scope, maybe the tear, the meniscus tear is worse than we think. And he might need to miss, you know, maybe six weeks or eight weeks. Who knows? Um, but as of right now, it sounds like two to four weeks, bone bruise and a slight meniscus tear. That's what the MRI showed. Fingers crossed that that's all it is. Uh, his status for week one is still in jeopardy. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, not the end of the world, though, to have Joe Flacco revenge game uh, week one. Um, I, I guess we'll just hop into – we'll start with the Zach Wilson injury. I mean, because like as you said, it was about as nightmarish of a start as you can get. Eagles score relatively easy on their first touchdown drive. We'll talk about that drive. And then uh, Zach Wilson in completion – I thought no, no push in the run game at all. I thought Zach had a nice third down play to Tyler Conklin. That was good. Uh, and then brutal interception. We'll, we'll break that down a little bit. Uh, then it's like defense allows another touchdown. Zach started to get it going. I felt like, you know, he had that nice third down completion to more, even on the, the play he gets injured. Like he saw that mobility and apparently he's been running a lot more um, in camp and, and using that mobility to, to buy extra time and create throwing windows and whatever. Uh, and then, yeah, that injury, like you said, and, and at first it really didn't seem that bad to me when I watched it. Um, it wasn't until you, then you start to watch the replays and you're like, Oh, this really was a completely like non-contact knee injury. And then there's all the Twitter doctors, like you say, and I'm sorry. I mean, that's such a Bush league to be, I, I appreciate the Twitter doctors giving their opinion 
and their own speculation, as long as they put that disclaimer of like, you know, look, without feeling the knee or looking at MRI, it's really hard to tell um, what actually happened. But based off the video, these are the things I think it could be. That's fine. I like that. I don't mind that. But the doctors out there that were just putting out Zach Wilson tears ACL in preseason opener and plugging that. And it's just like, that was such bullshit. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and it's not, I mean, like obviously for Jets fans that really sucked and that was a hard shit. That was a hard game to watch. Like it completely took us out of it. We would have been worried regardless, but um, just the, you know, the entire thing is just such bullshit. They're just trying to get attention and clicks and they're going to lie and exaggerate things. And, you know, there's even, I won't say anybody by names, but there's a, there was a certain somebody, former Jets player, guy who's had some media connections who just puts out, it is believe Zach Wilson tore his ACL. It's like, well, what does that mean? Does that mean you have a source? Cause when he said that, it was kind of like, okay, this guy has connections to the Jets. Somebody knows somebody who talks to the team doctor and said, Hey, the stability test isn't good. Like it was really that tweet that really made me think, Oh geez. And then they cut to Douglas and he just looks like he's dead inside watching this game, just completely zoned out. He had the face of every single Jets fan at that moment. So it was like, wow, you know, maybe he really, you know, we've seen plenty of guys tear their ACL and walk right off the field like he did, but maybe this is an ACL and I, that the whole situation like was such a nightmare, but I'm glad it, it worked out for the Jets. Uh, here's my question to you, Mike. What are your thoughts on the injury itself? We'll talk about his performance, but I, should Zach even be playing in that situation behind two tackles who have no business starting even a preseason game? I like Max Mitchell, but your two starting tackles are out. I, maybe Is it just retrospect? Is it more on Zach Wilson for not just getting out of bounds and sliding? I mean, is for a guy who's already played a season in the NFL or these preseason games – even really worth it when you can get joint practices and I don't know, is that just completely just hindsight and the, the, the scare of potentially losing him for the entire season? Um, just kind of what, what's been going through your head uh, the last few hours uh, after that potential injury scare. Okay. So in general, I usually am in the camp that believes, you know, it is good to get some preseason reps in for your veterans, for your starters, because, you know, for me, I just think, it's so many months since the last time you play that, you know, it's good to just get your feet wet again, just get some reps in, you know, get some live action against another opponent besides your own team. Um, so generally that is the way I look at it, but, you know, after this, and I know there have been plenty of injuries that the jets themselves have had, but this, this might be the nail in the coffin that turns me to the other side where I'm like, just, I don't think it's necessary. And I know you and I have kind of talked about it, but the joint practices kind of give you a lot of the same benefits that I just talked about while still giving you the, giving the quarterbacks the protection of, you know, the practice protection that you get in training camp wearing a red jersey. jersey. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I think joint practices can kind of give you those benefits. See another team uh, that's, you know, playing to not necessarily beat you, but, you know, a team that is not working in conjunction with your team, see some something different um, and get those reps in, but also not risk um, the damage as much. And the same goes for the rest of the team too. I know there's still plenty of contact, but it's still not real live game contact, a little bit subdued compared to that. So I don't know, this might be what turns me over to the side where I start believing just it's not worth it. These guys are, unless you're a rookie, or, you know, obviously the guys fighting for roster spots, but your key starters who have played at least one season, maybe it's best to just not take the risk, even if it's a handful of snaps. But at the same time, there is a lot of hindsight here because, you know, it's it as, as much as you don't want to take the risk, it's still so unlikely to happen, especially in such a small dosage of snaps. I mean, you know, when you look at the big picture and think about how often injuries happen, the odds of an injury happening in two drives is it's very low and it's still just a, an awful break as much as you could, you know, blame the jets for not for calling plays that don't ask them to get the ball out quickly for putting them out there behind backup tackles him for not sliding, whoever you want to blame. Ultimately it's just awful luck is all it is. There are a lot of guys who played that game yesterday who took huge hits, even the quarterback on the other side took an enormous hit and he was just fine so it's just kind of football that's how it works sometimes injuries happen at random moments it's never likely to happen but 
it does happen sometimes. So it's, it's, it's just a tough break more than anything, but I think you can, you know, start to wonder about, you know, whether it's worth giving these guys reps, do they really need it? Is it worth the risk as low as that risk might be for a couple of series? uh, Is it worth it? I think I'm going to start to going forward, maybe shift towards that camp where maybe it's not, but at the end of the day, it's just a tough break. And I know he easily could have slid or went out of bounds, but you know, it's, that's just part of his game. I feel like he's that kind of player who's going to try to make plays and, you know, play that confidence style. He had just thrown an interception the previous drive. He's kind of try, trying to shake that rust off, get some good plays in his mind. Uh, and he's, you know, he did avoid the contact is the thing, but obviously didn't work in a way that benefited him. So I don't know. I think there's a little hindsight in terms of should he have slid or not? Cause I feel like if the injury didn't happen, we wouldn't really discuss it as much. Although, you know, I, I still think most people would have preferred he did. So you can put a little bit of blame on it, on him for not sliding, but ultimately it is just a tough break more than anything. So, um, but fortunately, it seems like uh, things worked out. But I think the biggest takeaway for me is maybe going forward, don't play your starters. I don't know. What do you think in terms of the balance of, you know, how much value is there to playing your important players in one or two preseason drives? I think, okay, obviously it's a case-by-case basis. And, like, I'm fully willing to admit this is revisionist history, but that's okay. You can, you know, yeah. you see something happen and you can change your opinion on it because – yeah, if you ask me on Monday, I'm talking about, oh, I'm so excited to see Zach Wilson on Friday. You know, like, you, right. I'm excited to see him play. Excited to see what's going to happen. But, yeah, for a guy who, first of all, same system as last year. That's the, like, for a quarterback, if you're a rookie and you've never played an NFL environment, or even if you're a vet but you switched teams or offensive coordinators or whatever, it's like, all right, well, I'm, I, I want to get some game experience with the system. He's played in an NFL environment. He knows the system like the back of his hand. He's had a good camp. Um it's like he's built chemistry with his teammates in practice. How much more chemistry is he really building in these two drives in the preseason? Um, It's like, he's seeing these coverages. And like you said, with the joint practices, he can get a a look at a different defense and see different coverages, but he has the protection of the red Jersey. Um, And when you, then when you factor in the fact that his two starting tackles are out this week, it it just made in retrospect, they really shouldn't have played him. That's just my opinion. That is complete revisionist history. I wouldn't have said that on Monday. I'm willing to accept it. But moving forward, it's just like there really isn't much of a a point unless you're a rookie or you change uh, systems or you're a guy fighting for a roster spot. The defense, the starting defense, I can kind of understand because they don't do too much live tackling. So this is the first time they really get to tackle. And so a lot of times, like I noticed that, especially in 2020 when they didn't have preseason games, the tackling was really bad at the beginning of that season. I mean, the Jets were just terrible that season anyway, but specifically that September, if you remember, the Jets were terrible at tackling the, the, uh, the run. They had that game against San Francisco where they, the guy broke like, it was like third and 30 or something. And the guy broke four tackles and got the first down. Um, so like, I can understand for the defense, the benefit of tackling, but for your quarterback and your big play, you know, your big skill position guys. And even on the defense and you know, your pass rushers, like Carl, like I like that they sat Carl Lawson. I would have sat Quinnen. They played him. They sat JFM. They sat Mosley. They sat Joyner. Reed was already out with an injury. Um, but like the, the move that Zach made himself. And like you said, clearly he, if, if that was like the first play of the drive, I don't know if he would have cut in like that, but like, yeah, he's playing hero ball because he feels like, he had a shitty first drive, the the miss and the interception. He wants to prove people that he's improved. Um, He has that one man to beat. And if you look at it, I haven't seen the all 22. I've just seen the, like some of the different camera angles for looking at the injury. There really wasn't anybody there. If he gets past Dean, he might have a 60 yard touchdown, 65, 70 yard touchdown. Even if he gets a, just gets a 25 yard run, that's still a big highlight play. You know, if he makes that guy miss and he cups up the field, we're all talking about, wow, look at what the athlete Zach Wilson is. Cause he is an amazing athlete and he's underrated. He is a good runner and that, that is a part of his game. And that type of cut that he make that he made is just a freak, just a freak incident. Like he's going to make a cut like that a hundred times this season. So it's not like, it's not like he was sitting in the pocket. He just got blindsided by a defensive end who just beat Chuma Doga and he, you know, broke his knee or something or broke his leg. It's like, that is a little bit more directly on the coaches should sit him, whatever. But for me, it's just like, anytime you're on that field, your season and your career is on the line. 
So why not just wait until it counts? You have a 17 game season. This guy has been in the system. He's had a good camp. He played last year. It's just like, it, there really isn't much to gain from two drives in this game and a, a quarter and a half next game outside of just for us fans. It's fun to watch, but yeah, moving forward, I don't want to see, assuming this is a similar situation. I don't want to see Zach in any, any preseason games. Um, right. I, I think that's what the discussion is because I think, you know, the injury itself is chalked up to bad luck. I think more so than anything, the conversation you have is, is it worth putting him out there to take that risk more so than should he have slid? Should he be playing behind backups and all that? I think it's just, should he be out there or not? Cause you put the guy out there. The injury risk is always present regardless of what's happening. If you have the best offensive line in the league, you're still going to get sacked sometimes and you're still going to have injury risk on those plays. And then there are plays like this where it wasn't even the worst contact in the world and the injury can still happen. So it's, it's just more so a conversation for me of not, you know, do I blame him for sliding? Should he be out there with backups? And more like, do you want to take that risk? And there's a point that a good point you made when we were discussing this yesterday, um, you know, cause I was talking about the point that I brought up was maybe it's beneficial to get out there and, you know, take some hits and get reacclimated after not playing for a few months, but you made yeah. a really good counterpoint and said that, you know, for a guy who's been playing quarterback his whole life, it's more so um, like an accumulation of deterioration more so than it's, you know, him getting reused, getting used to a, yeah. getting hit again. Like it's more of a negative effect to continue getting hit and racking up those hits over the years than it is for him than his body needing to get used to it again you know yeah he, he's not like a muay thai fighter conditioning his shins or something like that by right. taking sacks in a preseason game he's played in the nfl before he's added weight and you know i'm no doctor but i you know he has added a significant amount of muscle in a short amount of time and sometimes it takes your ligaments and your knees and stuff to adjust to those hard violent cuts i mean the NFL is about as athletic as it gets and you have to make those sharp lateral movements he's added 10 15 pounds of muscle the chance for something like that happening is, is elevated. Um, these are all just things and clearly retrospect. I don't blame the jets for playing him. I just think it's, it's a good lesson to learn now. It's just like, that was way too close. And still knock him, Michael, you better knock him wood. Knock him wood. You heard it. You hear that? Yeah, there's okay. We'll okay. Knock him. My dad, my dad blames you for the back to injury. Cause you didn't knock last week. Um, I accept that. I accept still don't know the full extent of it, but it seems like the jets dodged a major bullet here. Um, yeah, it, it's just, and also the other thing was, you know, the Quincy Williams hit, and I'm sure we'll talk about the defense. There's still some more stuff from Wilson, but briefly on the Quincy Williams hit, I it was a, it, obviously, as Salah said, egregiously awful, bad hit. If that was an Eagles player on Zach Wilson, I'd be pissed. It's a dumb penalty. The Jets defense got off the field. That was third down. They did a nice job. Like their whole defense is kind of built on, you know, we're going to give up some yards, but we're going to limit the explosives. We're going to, come up big on third down we're going to hold you in the red zone we'll create turnovers you know what i mean like to beat us they're going to have to take a bunch of you know death by a million paper cuts right that's kind of the, the philosophy of the defense and to be fair like on the big explosive that the eagles had on that drive which is when hertz rolled out and he found uh, his receiver like 30 yards down the field quinnon was right in his face it was a great rep from quinnon williams just couldn't close it hertz gets the the deep receiver the jets held held him to three quincy knocks him out um knocks jalen hurts uh, you know with a big hit um, the biggest thing I didn't like about that outside of extending the drive, it's preseason's penalty is just like, I just felt it put a target on Zach's back, which is just so what you don't need to do in a preseason game. It's like, I love Quincy. I'm higher on him than you are. I think he has a high ceiling. I know a lot of Jets fans are, are lower on him, but the way he plays, how violent he is, how explosive he is. He's certainly the most athletic linebacker that I've seen the Jets since I've been watching him, the way he flies around the field and closes distance you don't, he has to remove those plays from his game. But um, the biggest thing for me is once he did that, I think I tweeted it too. I was just like, oh, well, thanks, Quincy, for putting a giant target on Zach's back. And, and not only was Zach thinking about the interception or whatever as to why he cut up field and wants to show off to people, part of it is like, hey, I don't want to run out of bounds here and get clocked. You know, I'm sure that maybe went through his mind. Who knows? Maybe I'm just reaching here. But um, the whole thing was terrifying, a real scare for the season, and just a reminder of how low things can get uh for jets fans i mean i was just sitting there contemplating my fandom uh it was a real dark i mean just it doesn't even seem real for three hours we were having jimmy garoppolo versus joe flacco debates the entire twitter timeline was in shambles we have 
18 different unverified Twitter doctors confirming that Zach has a, a torn ACL. I mean, it was just uh, about as nightmarish of a uh, preseason opener as you can have, considering the Jets won. And again, this is a preseason game that consists of three Douglas draft classes, a bunch of young players that we were excited to watch. Like we've watched plenty of shitty preseason games with a bunch of bad undrafted guys that we don't care about. Like all the way through this game, there was somebody on the field that I was interested in watching, which you can't always say for the preseason. So this should have been a better experience. The whole start of the game, specifically Zach's injury really ruined it. But when you go back and look at it, um, you know, the jets backups toughed it out. The defense didn't look as great. Um, I guess Let's stick with the offense, then we'll get to the starting defense. We talked about the injury. We haven't really talked about his performance. Um, actually, you know, before we get to the performance, let's talk about this. With the timetable, we'll have a month to discuss this, but with the current timetable, two to four weeks, depends when he gets the scope. The season opener is about four weeks from now. If he waits a little bit longer in the second opinion and doesn't get the scope until Wednesday, who knows? Week one is certainly in jeopardy. He might play, he might not play. Uh, what are your thoughts on potentially trotting out Joe Flacco? Because the points you raised to me last night, it was kind of like, look, Joe Flacco for an entire season is demoralizing. Joe Flacco for six weeks sucks. Joe Flacco for one game, two games, specifically that one game, you know, the revenge game against the Ravens, not the worst thing in the world. Uh, I, you know, I'm not, and we're going to that game. We bought tickets to that game. I was excited yep. to see Zach and Zach still might play, but I will say if, if Joe Flacco plays, you, you may you raised a lot of good points to me last night. It's not the end of the world. The Jets and maybe have a, a, I don't want to say a better chance to win, but maybe not a drastically worse chance at, at winning with Joe Flacco versus Zach Wilson in that particular game. Yeah. I mean, I think Joe Flacco is about as good of a backup as there is in the league right now. And and you said it, that's exactly my point. Um, you know, if Wilson did miss the whole season or most of it, I don't think he's a guy who you would want starting the whole season for this team right now, considering, you know, They want to take a step forward. They want to develop. I don't know if Flacco's that guy, but to win one game when my quarterbacks hurt or two games, if that's what it takes, then he is pretty reliable. I mean, this is a guy who over his two years with the Jets has nine touchdowns and three picks. And I know he hasn't been perfect. He didn't win any of the games he started, but, you know, for a backup quarterback, that is really solid. There aren't a lot of backups who do that, let alone, one in this situation where he hasn't had a ton of help or played on the greatest team. So um, week one against the Ravens, I do think there are some reasons to, I don't think he's better. I'm not going to say that, but I do think there are reasons to think there are some aspects of his skill set that could work against this particular team. And specifically, I think his deep passing, and obviously we know Zach has a great arm, but you know, Flacco, and we saw this in 2020, he can still throw a really nice deep ball, throw it with touch and accuracy. And the Ravens are an aggressive man defense. They blitz a lot. They dare you to beat them. And there could be some opportunities for Elijah Moore, Garrett Wilson, Corey Davis to get some one-on-ones down the field. And Flacco could get some chances to air it out. I think that's what he does best at this point is throw that deep ball. Um, I feel like his short intermediate accuracy can be a little erratic at times. Um, he's taken some bad sacks. Like we think back to 2020 against Miami when he took the 30 yard sack or whatever it was. <laughs> so there are some definitely plenty of holes in Flacco's game, even at this point. But one thing I think he does do really well still at this point of his career is throw the deep ball. So, and I think the Ravens are a team that could be a little bit susceptible to that. They did add Marcus Williams at free safety. That should help them a little bit to combat those deep balls but um I think they're built for that to be their main weakness they're going to get a lot of sacks they're going to make plays on the football um they're going to have tight man-to-man coverage in the short and intermediate ranges but they're I think they can be gotten deep if you have a good deep passer and I think in terms of the floor of deep accuracy you'd think Flacco might be a little bit higher than Wilson right now the ceiling is right undoubtedly much higher for Zach Wilson but if I needed a based on what we've seen on film throughout their careers right now, Flacco may be a little bit better there. And again, this is not to say I'd prefer Flacco. I'd much prefer Wilson, but again, just taking an optimistic point of view, I think this is one reason to feel like maybe Flacco 
will have some chances to make some big plays against his former team. Right. And it's just a cool storyline too. Yeah. Like that, that will add some juice to it to kind of make up for the fact that you lost your starting quarterback. If it happens um, yeah. just for him to play his former team. So I think there's some reasons to still be optimistic. Yeah. If we had bought tickets to this game already and it was like against the dolphins, it'd be a little more of a, a bummer, but for some reason, Flacco going up against his old team, I just kind of feel like the, the stars might align for a vintage Joe Flacco performance. And to some of the points you raised, like the ceiling of this Jets offense is clearly significantly higher with Zach Wilson. The reports that Joe Flacco has outplayed Zach Wilson in training camp are false. Zach Wilson has had a really good training camp, specifically the last week. He's put together multiple good day, multiple good days. We'll talk about his performance in a second, because obviously it wasn't great in this game. Um, but the thing with Joe is like, like you said, like he's, he's a veteran. He's gone up against the rate. I mean, he's been a member of the Ravens for a decade, obviously it's a different defensive coordinator, but he knows Harbaugh. He knows the type of defense they want to play. They play that, that comp, uh, that complicated front where they have a lot of linebackers at the line of scrimmage. Are they blitzing on the zero? Are they dropping linebackers into coverage? It's week one. It's a lot of energy. It's a lot of excitement. I just feel like you know, like Flacco has to play week one. I wasn't expecting Zach to have a great game week one anyway. Um, if Flacco has to play week one, he has to play week one. It doesn't really lower my excitement for that game as much as maybe it, it could have. Um, just like you said, the storyline of having him be the starter there for a decade and winning a Super Bowl and then passing the baton off to Lamar. And now it's like his revenge game. And also you talk about Flacco's performance with the Jets in two seasons. Who has he had to throw to in those two seasons? Obviously, Elijah Moore was healthy for that Dolphins game last year. But Flacco does have arguably the best offense he's had around him in a long time. I mean, when you think about the weapons that he'll have as at his disposal, um, it could be pretty fun. And if Zach plays, I think it'll be fun as well. It's just, you know, Zach has shown this preseason game certainly showed it a little bit, you know, he's still gets a little amped up, starts to overthink things. He has to settle into the game a little bit. It's a complicated defense, you know, week one, the offensive line is still gelling together. Um, who knows? I, I think, the Jets with Zach and with Flacco are about even for week one. Obviously, we want to see Zach uh, play the entire season. I think Zach is the better quarterback. I think he has the higher ceiling. But for week one, I'm not, I'm not, I won't be too mad if Flacco plays. And maybe the Jets should be cautious with Zach because this is the second time he's had an injury on this knee, um, a serious two- to four-week injury on this knee. Uh, and that's something to monitor. And meniscus, even if they're mild tears, they can, you know, linger. So this is just something that I think Zach is going to have to wear a brace on that right knee, and they're going to have to be careful with him. I think him running is going to be part of his game, but he has to get down. It's just, it's just the way, uh, the nature of the game. And that wasn't a contact knee injury. I get it. He could still cut up the field and make, I, I know he's a game or I know he wants to cut the field and make that play, but in a preseason game, he has to get down. Uh, the only bummer of the, I mean, there's a few bummers, but the biggest bummer of this for me is that he doesn't get the joint practices. He doesn't get the rest of camp to kind of get ready for the season. Um, but I think he ended camp on a relatively high note. I know the game wasn't great, but he still had a few nice completions before the injury. And then he gets to kind of take a break, you know, let his body heal for the next month. Obviously he'll get all the mental reps. He'll be in the quarterback room. Um, and then we'll see when he returns. What? Uh, let's say he's close to, let's play hypothetical here before we get into his performance in the rest of the preseason game. Hypothetical, he's close to ready week one. Let's say he's about like, 85 percent week one right do you play him or do you try to play flag like in other do you do you wait until zach is 100 percent healthy it's a 17 game season he's the face of your franchise you know i feel like flack will have a solid game against the ravens do you do you do you wait a week do, like when is the best out of that that early game stretch the jets go right into a gauntlet to throw him in there is the browns week two on the road against jacoby Brissett a good time the Bengals at home did they wait until week five like when do you think is a good time to throw him in there, assuming he's close to healthy around the opener, but maybe not a hundred percent. I think uh, the selfish part of me wants to say, just get him out there. But I think you have to wait until he's a hundred percent. At this point, you just feel absolutely so lucky that he is, you know, that you even get to have these conversations. Right. And I think you just make sure he's a hundred percent before you throw him back out there. Um, and just, hopefully get him in the best position to finish out the rest of the year without having a midseason injury. Because I was talking to you earlier and it's, it's so wild how many of these minor injuries the jets have had to their starting quarterback over the past few years. I think it's six years in a row now that their primary week one quarterback has eventually had like a three to four week injury during the season. 
you know, last year was Wilson. Before that, uh, three years in a row, Darnold had at least one of those. Um, McCown had one 2016. So, or 2017. So, um, so, oh, and 2016, Geno Smith tore an ACL. Yeah. 2015, Geno Smith broken jaw and Ryan Fitzpatrick thumb right. injury. I mean, yeah, the Jets quarterbacks the last eight seasons or so. I mean, maybe that's a direct correlation with the offensive line play, but, but yeah, they've had some scares at that position. Yeah. So I say just, you got to play it safe. And I think they will because they clearly seem confident in Flacco, confident enough to the point where he didn't even suit up for this preseason game, which brings up another discussion. Cause I mean, I know Zach Wilson's a lot younger, needs the reps, but you know, he is your starting quarterback. So you do think he's better than Joe Flacco. So he's playing, but Flacco's not, this is, this is very hindsighted because there's, there's no way I, I, would have been saying this before the game. So there's definitely a lot of hindsight to this, but it does bring up new conversations going forward regarding how you should approach this. But either way, yeah, I think wait till he's 100%. Flacco can hold it down for a couple games, especially against a familiar division. Not that he's played against these exact players, but you know, he, he has played against some of those guys in the Ravens. He's played in Cleveland quite a bit. Yeah, so. he knows Harbaugh, yeah. he knows Tomlin. He, yeah, he, he, I know what you mean by that um it is an interesting discussion you kind of raised and we have so much more to talk about so we got to move on but um yeah do you do you play Flacco next week I mean based off everything we just said 15 minutes ago no uh, you could even make the argument they should play any starters because with the joint practices for the next two weeks I mean what exactly do they get I don't know right uh, that with this whole scare I would almost be like you know what it's the Mike White show you know bench every I would pretty much bench most starters but maybe that's me being too conservative but hey Sean McVay, Super Bowl winning coach, he doesn't play any of the starters in, in preseason, so maybe there's something to it. I don't know. I then it gets tough with like the rookies. Like, do, do you want to throw Sauce out there and risk something or Garrett Wilson? Who knows? Um, oh, and one last just because you touched on it briefly, I agree with you 100. percent They should wait until Zach is 100. Um, percent So if that's week if that's week one, that's great. I hope. I, I think there's still a good chance it could be. If it's week two, if it's week three, if they have to wait till week five, whatever, I just think you wait till he's 100%. Because going back to what happened with Beckton this week, I put a lot of blame on the Jets. I do. I mean, again, injuries are freak, you know, accidents. They can happen whenever. They can happen to whoever. But with Beckton, and we didn't get a chance to talk about this on the podcast, you're talking about a 370-pound man who's coming off of reconstructive knee surgery who put a brace on the week before. So clearly that knee was giving him issues who is limping the entire practice before he gets injured. Nobody pulls him out. Nobody protects Makai from Makai. And then he blows out his knee. And it's like, like, and I wasn't there. So maybe Makai's like, no, I'm fine. I'm staying in, but you have to protect him from himself, especially when he's limping throughout the entire practice. And the, the, I, anybody who listens to this podcast knows we're as optimistic as it gets about this team and non-reactionary as it gets about this team for the most part. Um, but I, I think that's a bit of a stain on the coaching staff and the training staff just the way they handled Beckton, even going back to last year, going back to last year and through this year, Beckton has dealt with an entire year of people calling him injury prone and that he can't stay on the field. And this is a make or break year for him. Of course, he's not going to pull himself out if his knee is feeling a little unstable. The Jets should have pulled him out and maybe that wouldn't have happened. So who knows? But there was, a, I did see some reports saying that a lot of this was connected to, to Beckton's decision not to get uh, full surgery last, last year. So some of that goes, and apparently that was, Becton's decision that he didn't want to go for that surgery last year. That's what I read. So who knows if that's true, but I do put a lot of, I do put some blame on the jets for how they handled Becton this past week. And I think you look to Zach the same way, protect Zach from himself. Don't put him out there until he's hundred percent. You have Joe Flacco for this reason. He can win you some games. Uh, and then we can, you know, ease Zach into the season. So that's it on the injury. We have a hundred thing, more things to talk about tonight. Let's first start with Zach Wilson's performance. Briefly. We talked a lot about him. Um, are you concerned at all based off that I think a lot of people were freaking out after the inaccurate Paul ball and the bad interception um I feel like I was on the cooler side of things you were not Michael dms me every time anything bad happens in any Jets game that our season's over and all these guys suck he's clearly kidding but it pisses me off every time and I have to mute him um you had some interesting dms after that Zach Wilson pick so how are you feeling um a few hours later just thinking about his performance ignoring the injury no, I, I mean, I think I'm looking at it in the most objective way possible. I think you have to be honest and admit that there were some bad reps in there. But at the same time, it's not the end of the world. 
when you make two bad plays in the preseason and it, and it's not the path to superstardom if you make two good plays in the preseason like we saw last year I mean he was great in the two preseason games last season and it meant nothing and we've seen a lot of guys play poorly in the preseason and it doesn't mean anything either so I think you look at it objectively he made a couple of mistakes that um, that were they were bad plays and you want to see him improve off of them but it's not necessarily an indicator of what's going to happen when he makes you know hopefully you know provide he's healthy you know 500 plus plays in the regular season a huge sample size of reps to get in there two plays in the preseason aren't going to tell you how that bigger sample size of plays are going to shake out so but they but there were a couple of ones in there that were definitely concerning you know the first throw to Garrett Wilson, short little route in the flat, kind of rushed it, airmailed him pretty badly. Um, those, you know, those are the type of throws that we've talked about it when we've been discussing what we want to see from him in practice in the preseason. One of the things we've consistently said is we don't want to see him miss those easy throws, get those, you know, make those layups. And, you know, that was a layup he missed. So it was a little discouraging to see that. Um, and then the interception a couple of plays later, um, we looked at it. A couple times and you know it was there were two routes to that side it was um i think it was conklin in the flat yep, and then conklin. davis was uh sitting down going over the middle and you know he read that conklin you know it was he's basically reading those two routes conklin in the flat then davis intermediate he looked at conklin in the flat probably should have thrown that um, but he passed on it went straight to davis and just uncorked it with no feel for the linebacker there and the linebacker didn't even – I like, initially watching it, again, I was kind of zoned out after um, – actually, this was before the injury. But um, initially, I didn't even realize. I thought the linebacker was at the line of scrimmage and dropped back. But he didn't. He was just in a traditional alignment about five yards off the line of scrimmage, just sitting right there. So uh, it, was, it was concerning that he didn't recognize that, you know, he either – whether he predetermined it or he just, you know, had a complete lapse of – concentration there whatever the reason it's definitely the kind of pick that to me you don't want to see especially because he threw one against the Panthers like that last year and I think a couple actually I think he had one like that against the Eagles um and then he had one in the green and white scrimmage a couple weeks ago so he's got to be more cognizant of the linebackers for sure um so those those were two bad plays definitely film that he can learn from uh but at the same time it's not it's not the end of the world all right, you tell me. You tell me if I'm being too much of a homer with this opinion. I'm sure I'll hear about okay. it in the, the comments and the tweets. Um, like you said, bad play, not a good play. Um, but I, I thought the overreactions to it were ridiculous because, like you said, look, it's two reps in a preseason game. The first, like, is it still concerning that it, it seems like he maybe gets the jitters a bit at the beginning of the game? That's at least just kind of what I see from that Garrett Wilson miss. Like, I don't think he's missing that throw that often. He hasn't in camp. Last year, did he miss it in game if, in games a few times? Sure, but he's had a good camp. And we talked about that at the start of training camp of like, what are the most important things we can evaluate from these guys, specifically Zach, in training camp? And the biggest thing we talked about was consistency, like stacking good days on top of good days. And he's done that. He's had the last week. It seems like he's turned a corner. He's right, getting yeah. more completions. He's getting the ball out of his hands. He's just, he's just finding the completions. And then the big plays are coming later. Um, in this one, it's like, okay, it's a preseason game. The, he misses the throw to Garrett Wilson. I wish he didn't. That was an easy five yard stuff first down, but he did. All right. That's fine. You move on. Those throws happen. I thought his, his throw to Conklin was on third down was really nice. It was a third and nine. He had to go through his reads there. He found Conklin sitting down, and Conklin was able to dive ahead for the first. So I thought that was a good play, and I thought he was starting to He also to got hit, um, courtesy of Vidoga. Right, he did get hit uh, on that play as well. Um, then, and again, some of this ties to the running game. When you're facing these second and nines and these third and nines, you feel the urgency to force things a little bit more. Um, the Jets weren't getting any push in the interior. Connor McGovern is sneaky terrible. That's what I said to you last night when I'm rewatching it um because he's I just dis a guy i disagree but, but go he's ahead a, he's a guy to me that is like 70 percent of the time he's solid five percent of the time he is he's great and 25 percent of the time he's awful that's how i feel and I, maybe that's hyperbolic but i feel like every time i see Connor mcgovern he's falling face first he's missing uh you know an open rusher coming right up the middle and again like 
you know, it's a zone blocking scheme. You don't know exactly who's in charge of what, but he's playing next to Lakin and he's playing next to AVT. Um, the, you know, he had a bad block on, on a run in, in this one preseason game. So I won't overreact to him as I try to downplay Zach's bad plays, but that's just my opinion on Connor McGovern. I'm tired of him getting a pass for whatever reason, just because we paid him. I don't, I don't feel like, I feel like he's one of those guys that if he's struggling again at the beginning of the season, I know we got it together last year towards the end, but I don't know. I, I don't, I don't see it with Connor McGovern, but anyways, I, but, I think you're underrating him, but that, that's another discussion. I probably am. I probably am, but he's had too many of those boneheaded plays or bad plays where he's, he's the, so he, he never really stands out to me as like an amazing center. He's just a Jag to me. He's just a guy. That, that's just how I feel. Uh, and yeah, if you go back and watch, I think it was the first run. It might've been the second. It was the first run. Yeah. He just, he whiffs and falls down and you know, Spencer tackle comes right up and makes the play. So or maybe he's a linebacker, but anyway, yeah. Zach on that interception. Well, then he had the nice completion to tell Elijah Moore. Can't forget that. Uh, actually I think it was after the interception, but anyway, on the interception, like you said, two on three on his right side, he had a three V three on his left side. I kind of feel like, you know, he, if you're going to read that right side, the throw is Conklin because for anybody who goes back and watches it, the appealing thing about that, that play and that formation is that nobody's directly in the flat for the Eagles. So whoever's going to have to guard the flat is going to have to come flying down. So just give it to Conklin, let him get four yards. Maybe he breaks a tackle. Maybe he gets eight yards of first down. Who knows? Um, you know, as soon as the play snaps, he looks right at Conklin. He should have just thrown it, but he sees 22, uh, the cornerback, whatever he starts to run after Conklin. And for yeah, whatever he was reason, the, he was the inside corner, the two corners too. Yeah, so the he slot was corner. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, when he saw him start to run towards Conklin, he sees Davis get open on that curl and he knows he can, he thinks he can fit it in there uh, before the safety gets there, which he's right. Um, but yeah, he doesn't really see the linebacker. And then when you go to the, the view, I, I, I have no doubt that he knew the linebacker was there. Like, I think he probably felt him. It's possible that he just thought he was blitzing or didn't see him at all. But if you go to the, the view behind the end zone, it, it kind of just feels like, I don't know. And he just over, he just trusted his arm too much to squeeze it into that hole. I think he, if he put a little bit more on that ball, maybe he fires it in there. He completes it. Um, but either way, too tight of a window to try to squeeze that ball into. And he paid the price. But anyway, here's my opinion that maybe he's a little homer. I really, those types of interceptions to me, they happen, especially for a young quarterback like Josh Allen, for all the quarterback that he is now, and he's the guy that we keep looking at for Zach Wilson. His first game of his second year was against the Jets, and he had like five turnovers. Was it four turnovers or five turnovers? He had a bad game. That's just all I'm trying to say. They won the game, but he had a bad game. Josh Allen slowly started to turn it around, and there's all this pressure on Zach Wilson to turn it around immediately. This is a guy who's played 13 NFL games in his career. He's Every single rep in practice is scrutinized. Every single play in preseason is scrutinized. He's just a guy that he's – if you listen to his coaches, if you just watch him at training camp, he's objectively gotten better. He's going to have some bad plays. That interception to me – is different than like go back to week two against new england there are times where he just looks completely panicked as he's overthinking his brain is scrambled and he heaves it into triple coverage intercepted that's a different interception than him you know not just dumping the ball off to conklin instead thinking he could squeeze it into davis and the linebacker he doesn't see the linebacker and he jumps the route i mean patrick mahomes throws those types of interceptions so if it's a consistent thing is it a big deal yes is it a bad play yes does that mean that he's hasn't made any improvement no. Am I going to overreact to that play? No. Like that was just, it's the same kind of feeling I had against Houston last year where he had like the underhanded toss to Ty Johnson who turned around and it bounced off his back and the Texans picked it off and everybody was like, Oh, what an idiot boneheaded play by Zach Wilson. It's just like that play to me is just a learning experience and it's not indicative of, of any, it's like he saw Ty Johnson. He thought Johnson knew he was going to flip it to him. Johnson turned around interception. Like, it happens. I just think the overreactions to every play specifically in preseason, because it's all we have um, is, you know, not important. And like, look, Jamar chase was a complete bust last year in preseason talking about, he can't see the lines and the ball. Like he couldn't college. And I don't know. I just think the overreactions were ridiculous. And I think he was on his, I think he started to get in a bit of a groove there on that second drive before the injury, like that completion to Moore was nice. And even the run before the injury, like even if he just slid out of bounds was nice. So I don't know. Um, I, I, I agree with you in terms of the overreaction. And I think the good point is the fact that this is all we have. And it's just, it's the same thing when it's week one of the regular season, when, you know, this is your whole body of work right now it is these five passes that he threw or whatever it was. And then week one comes in that one game, that's your team for the whole season right. to that point in time. So 
you overrate these things because this is all you have, but he's also thrown hundreds of passes in training camp, which, you know, that it's not a live game, but this isn't a real game either, you know, in a lot of ways. So it's, you know, it's overrating a couple of plays, but I, th- I think I'm more critical of that play than you are the interception. Um, Cause I feel like, I feel like it's the kind of play that once he's fully developed really shouldn't ever happen. I mean, I think the interceptions that, you know, are hard to avoid are, you know, pass gets tipped. Maybe you overthrow one sometimes, maybe you short arm it, you get hit, you know, these types of things. Yeah. But, but it wasn't, it wasn't an inaccurate pass. It wasn't like he looked panicked to me. It looked like he just, yeah. it was a bit of a, like, it was just, it was kind of lazy. It's kind of like, I think it's one of those interceptions that you can easily learn from. You see Conklin run to the flat there. There's nobody in the flat, throw it, take the four yards and second down, move on to the next play. It was just, he sees 22 darting down to the flat he sees Corey Davis get open on that curl. He trusts his arm that he can fire it in there. Linebacker jumps it. It's like, but that to me is like, that's, I don't know. It's fixable. This is a guy playing a preseason game. He can learn from it. He can, but I'm just hoping he does because this is definitely multiple times we've seen this now. So right, hopefully we, it is something he improves. Yeah. I don't know. I felt like he had, I don't know. Yeah. A bad play, a play that you, he needs to not keep making, but like, I feel like there were, there are different interceptions. There are levels to interceptions. And that one to me looked worse than it really was once I kind of went through his process and tried to watch it myself. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm a homer. Let me know, you know, you can criticize me in the comments, but who, who knows? I don't know. I just feel like it is what it is. All right, let's move on from Zach Wilson. Let's talk about the starting defense real quick. And then we have a lot of guys who stood out. And then some of the guys who roster spot is in jeopardy. Uh, and then a few other notes in the game, and then we'll get out of here. Uh, starting defense. Let me hear your thoughts first, because I just talked for a while about Zach Wilson. Obviously, two not so great jo- uh, drives for the starting defense, two touchdowns allowed. How do you feel well, watching them back, getting a, a chance to kind of analyze every player and, and see what the Jets are trying to do? I mean, I'm not super concerned with how the defense played at the start of the game, mostly because there were so many key guys not playing. I mean, no Lawson, JFM, uh, Mosley. Reed. Reed and Joiner. So that's basically half your starting defense. So it really wasn't the starting defense. Um, so mainly for that reason, I'm not reading into it too much. Um, and another reason is they stopped the Eagles on the first drive. They were going to kick a long field goal, but Quincy Williams had the uh, egregiously awful penalty to quote Robert Sala. Um, so they did stop them on the first drive. And then after that, it was set up by the interception by Zach Wilson. So I don't know. I don't think there's, there's that much bad to read into here. They didn't play well, but they didn't have half their starters in. They stopped them the first time. And the second one was a short field. So, right. I don't know. There's, I don't think there's too much to read into in terms of how poorly they played. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm not too concerned. That's kind of how I felt, but I didn't want to follow my downplaying Zach Wilson's interception with that. So I just, I figured I should turn it over to you, but yeah, it's like the style of defense uh, you know, they're bend, but don't break. They're going to give up some yards. They're going to try to limit the explosives. They rebounded on that first drive after giving up the big explosive. Quinnen almost had him for a sack. I don't know. I just, to me, I felt like the defensive line was getting good, consistent pressure. Like you said, it wasn't really the full starting defense. I thought the secondary had their moments. Um, you know, guys were flying to the ball, closing out. I don't know. I just feel like, yeah, it was not a good start at all. But the, the most concerning thing to me, honestly, with starting defense, if you want to call it that, was the second touchdown on that fourth and goal they lined up and i literally if you just go back and watch the game but they come out in nickel and they come out with you know i guess the eagles had two tight ends in the running back to the right side so they're the jets are kind of loaded to the right side but you pretty much just have nathan shepherd uh, as the three tech on the left side and nobody else in that area eagles are in shotgun running back to the right it's just like that just looks like a wide open touchdown they're just going to hand it off to the running back right at the middle in between the left guard and the center touchdown and i they, they got to the line i was like oh well that's a touchdown um and it easily was so that to me was just i we were watching that like what are they trying to do here we came to the conclusion like okay well if that's quinn and williams and that linebacker is cj mosley not delshawn phillips and that edge is carl lawson and not i, don't know, I think it was jacob martin or somebody you know that maybe it makes sense to say okay we're going to overload everything else we're going to try to bait them into the really obvious run right up the middle and then we'll make a play I think that's kind of what the call is there on the goal line is try to bait them into that one obvious hole and then everybody collapse on it. But 
when you're running it with Nathan Shepard and Delshawn Phillips in a preseason game on fourth down, it just didn't, I don't know, not, not the same. Um, all right. Uh, we talked about the starters. Let's go into some of the guys who stood out. Michael, I'll turn it over to you first. There are a few of them. I don't know where we want to start. Um, you know what? I'll give you an easy one. Michael Clemens. The entire defensive line as a whole played well, but Michael Clemens really flashed. You got a chance to rewatch it with, with me a few hours ago. What are your thoughts when you got to see Michael Clemens? Oh, yeah. I think he's definitely deserving of being the first non-Zach Wilson player mentioned, um, talking about individuals, because he is really good. And even as someone who was zoned out of this game, not really paying attention, uh, it was easy to notice 72 consistently in that backfield. He was really good. Um, just at creating pressure in the passing game. Uh, his his ball rush was just locked in. Guys couldn't stick with them. He's consistently knocking tackles and tight ends all the way into the pocket. And then that carried over into the run game. He's setting the edge really well. Uh, so he looked every bit as imposing as he does on that press conference podium, as it sounds he's been playing in training camp. Um, he looks very big for an edge edge defender he's broad he's strong uh he's tough to handle and you got to remember this is a guy who's going to be 25 years old later this month so you know he's a guy who in terms of his age is supposed to be entering you know what is usually the start of most NFL players prime so he is a guy in terms of his physical maturation who should be ready to you know contribute right away and you know compete with NFL caliber talent and he definitely looked the part in this game, you know, he just consistently standing out with how, you know, we call a lot of players, I posted this tweet, I think, but we call a lot of players a beast when they play well, but this was a literal embodiment of what a beast truly is. You know, he is just a, a force out there. So he was yeah. fun to watch. Yeah, his raw explosive power combined with that length uh, is scary. And I have to say, like, I knew he was an athletic freak, um, but the way he was shedding blocks and like, yeah, okay. He's going up against second stringers, but still, I mean, this is a fourth round rookie and like, I know he's 25, but we've seen plenty of fourth round rookies do nothing in the preseason. He looked uh, outstanding. He looked like a guy who should be active on game days. Uh, I was really interested in seeing how they used him because they moved him inside. They put him at three tech a few times. They used him like how they would use JFM right, yeah. maybe. Uh, and I think that's really interesting because he brings you a guy, if he is active on game days. Um, yeah. He could be that bigger long defensive end in the mold of Jermaine Johnson or a JFM or something. But I like the idea of kicking him inside on, on some pass rushing downs. Uh, yeah, he was just a guy who flew around the field and every time he made a tackle, he just brought that energy, brought that juice. Um, yeah. That, I mean, he, I think what, he, what did he get credit with like seven pressures or something? And then he had the, yep. Seven pressures. And then he had the really nice play on the run as well, where he, you know, shed two tackles, forced the, the running back all the way to the sideline got up and just started pounding the turf. And I was like, all right. I mean, I was all depressed about the Wilson injury, but I was watching Michael Clemens and I was like, oh, he might be a player. Um, the defensive line as a whole though, looked really good, which you'd expect considering how deep it is. Um, our guy Tanzel smart making plays. I thought he looked really, I thought he looked really good. And, and the best out of the reserve defensive tackles ahead of Nathan Shepard and Jonathan Marshall. He's a guy to me that I think, I think he has to put maybe one more preseason game together or, you know, a few more camp practices, but he's a guy that I think you can put ahead of Shepard and Marshall, just maybe it's just based off one game, but he dominated in the preseason last year. I don't know. He just seems like a guy that we keep hearing his name pop up and he looked um, outstanding uh, last night. So what are your thoughts on smart and some of the other Jets defensive linemen that, that popped? Yeah. I like smarts performance. He, he gets out the ball really well, just times the snap. Well, he's explosive seems to have the traits to fit this scheme. Um, he had a couple sacks, obviously. He finished them really well. I'm um, pretty sure both of them were low diving finishes, and he did a good job of grabbing the ankle. But he had some more pressures in addition to that, stopped a couple of runs. Um, I, I just like his combination of skills. He, like I said, he gets off the ball well, but he also has, you know, pretty good anchor strength, you know, can, is able to hold the point of attack, uh, control double teams pretty well like you said he was really good in the preseason last year um i think he checks the boxes that the jets are kind of missing at defensive tackle in terms of run defense but stopping the run in a way that fits the scheme you know because you can't just get a 350 pound guy and throw him on this d-line you need someone who could stop the run but do it 
as an explosive athlete and he fits that really well so if he can keep that keep this going for the next two games I think the Jets are gonna have a hard time cutting him and they might have to maybe make the surprise cut of Jonathan Marshall who didn't do much of anything in this game um so yeah I really like the way Smart played uh Jabari Zuniga was active in this game uh he had a sack and I think five yeah he had five pressures in total same as Smart so those three guys Clemens Smart Zuniga had themselves a nice day overall the D-line throughout this uh, throughout this night was very active at creating pressure yeah, and when we get to the, the some of the guys who maybe their stock went down a little bit, uh, there's there's a little bit more to say about Zuniga and Smart. Uh, you didn't mention Jermaine Johnson. I thought he had a nice game. He didn't play as yeah, much as, yeah. as Clemens and Zuniga, uh, but he certainly flashed. He was robbed of – I mean, it was it wouldn't have been an, a, an amazing sack or anything, but he was robbed of a sack because um, the, the play was whistled dead right as he was just screaming up the A-gap unblocked. Um, but, yeah, I mean, and then he, he pressured Jalen Hurts um, on a – I'm trying to remember the exact play um oh it was it was it was the Quincy Williams hit wasn't it it was in the first yeah I'm pretty sure it was the he, he pressured Jalen Hurts forced him out of bounds yeah, yeah. then Jalen Hurts ran up and, and Quincy knocked him out um but yeah I thought Jermaine looked uh, good as well he got less run than those other guys so maybe he didn't make as many plays he got double teamed a little bit more um but he still made an impact he made his presence felt he wasn't a, a no-show um so that was important and I thought he had some some really nice plays um it, let's go through the other rookies as well some of the top rookies Jermaine Johnson had a nice game I thought the other honestly I thought every rookie had a nice game every rookie from this class had something to, to take away from it um you talked about sauce you really didn't notice him at all but he played kind of a you know a good bit uh and not noticing a corner is always a good thing uh Brees Hall didn't do too much but he had one nice run that I you know that in particular was uh, you could, you could expand on this a little bit, but we were looking at it and it was third and one and hall definitely should have just taken the, the, uh, the hole that was right uh, available to him to just get the one yard. Maybe he could get three or four yards. Uh, I think in retrospect, you'd like to see him just hit that instead. He bounced it outside trust his, you know, he trusted that he could beat the safety one-on-one. He was right. It was a nice move. It showed off his athleticism. Um, it was fun to watch. It was very Le'Veon Bell like or Jonathan Taylor like. Like that was the play where you could see, oh wow, this guy's a real athlete. Um, but you maybe would like him just to take the the one yard on third and one. And then Garrett Wilson, out of all the rookies, I thought he had um, a really nice game. I mean, he just was consistently open. He should have gotten a touchdown from Mike White. He was wide open in the end zone. Um, but you certainly saw that start stop ability, the the sharpness in his route running, his explosiveness, uh, good hands. He was, he, all four of those rookies were exciting to watch. And even Ruckert had a nice block and a touchdown. And Mitchell, although he was the culprit for, uh, for Zach Wilson's injury, maybe. Not, I mean, not c- completely, but he forced Zach to, to roll out. Um, I thought Mitchell actually held up all right. He, he got a lot of run. Uh, and, you know, he, uh, I've, I'm a little higher on, on Mitchell after watching him a lot this week and, and you know, re- response to the Beckton injury. Uh, and I thought he held up all, all right, you know. He, is, is, he needs to... Obviously, he needs that strength. He looked a lot bigger out there than I, I think he looked in college. Um, he has good feet and good hands, but his feet need to be a little more active and his hands need to be a little less active from a non-offensive line expert just from watching him. Um, he you know, seems like a good athlete, just seems like he needs some coaching to refine some of the technique because he was getting knocked back a few times. Guys were using his hands and trying to you know, uh, trap him with different moves and stuff like that. But all in all, I thought that the entire rookie class had their own moments and nobody was a, was a no-show, so that's good. Yeah, I think it was a good game for the rookie class. Um, yeah, just from the top down, I think it was mostly positive for everyone. There weren't a ton of splash plays, but I think I think you got a glimpse from each player of what they could be capable of. I mean, you start at the top with Gardner. There, and this is your top five pick, and nobody was talking about this guy. And that's a great thing, considering the position he plays. Uh he played in coverage on 11 snaps and didn't get targeted a single time. And whenever that happens, it's typically earned by the corner and we can't see the all 22 view on the broadcast, but you know, from the limited amount of time you can see him in the screen, it did look like he was covering pretty well. So good quiet day from Gardner. Uh, Garrett Wilson had a nice performance. The, I think he had three catches, uh, two or three, but you know, his route running on those catches was good. Even on the one that Wilson missed to him, uh, Zach Wilson missed to him. Uh, he, he ran a pretty good route to get open. 
uh, you could just see the quickness. You know, maybe there is some refinement that he can make in terms of, you know, just the, the timing of his routes. Because, like, for example, the throw that Zach Wilson missed, not to excuse the throw. I think it's a bad throw either way. But there's definitely a lot of, you know, he puts a lot into his routes. There's a lot of action. It's not totally, you know, sometimes, uh, it's not totally like, you know, boom, boom. Like, there will be a lot of head fakes and extra steps, which, you know, it's very effective for sure. But, you know, sometimes it might not be completely in tune with the timing of the route of what the quarterback's expecting. So maybe that is something that he can end up needing to to sharpen. But the separation and the quickness was absolutely on display in this game um, with all the catches he made. And then there was a great slant route that he had in the uh, in the red zone that could have been a touchdown. Mike White didn't uh, attempt to throw to him, but he was open. So he was good. We talked about Johnson. Um, And another quick note on Johnson is that he was playing some interior as well, just like Michael Clemens was. Uh, He he got some three tech reps, which is very interesting. Um, It was cool to see both Clemens and Johnson doing that rotation because it does confirm that I think we are going to see JFM in that kind of role this season where he's, you know, doing that rotation inside and out because we didn't see a lot of that last year with pretty much any player on the D line, but this year it seems like it's going to be a fixture with specifically JFM and Clemens, but looks like Johnson could be getting some of that as well. Um, So Johnson had a nice game. I thought you saw his motor, you saw his ability to set the edge against the run. He had some, uh, some nice pressure as well. So good, good start for him. Um, And then Brees Hall, it wasn't, uh, he didn't get a ton of opportunities, but that one run he had was, I thought a glimpse of, you know, what he could become. And like you said, it, you know, when you watch it back, is there a hole up the middle on third and one he should probably take? Yeah, I think so. But this is a good point you made when we were watching it. He strikes you as kind of running back who's confident enough in his abilities to beat defenders to where, you know, if there's any sort of doubt pushing it up the middle into traffic, you know, he's just going to bounce it out and say, I'm going to trust myself to beat this defender instead of, you know, just riding the wave up the middle. And sometimes that might come back to bite him. We'll see what happens. But as talented as he is, I don't think that's going to happen a lot because you're going to see a lot of plays like this one where he bounces it out and he's just too fast and too sharp with his cuts to to be tackled. And he's going to be able to do what he wants on the edge. Um, you know, he did a great job in this play, even though he should have went up the middle, I, or you could argue that, um, you know, just pressing it up the middle, drawing the edge defender's, the contained guys on the outside, drawing them into the traffic, and then just boom, cutting outside. Those guys are too far in to be able to keep up with them to the edge. And he just used his speed to beat them and pick up a really nice game. So the top four guys, oh, Rucker had a touchdown. That was great to see. So overall, nice start for the class. Yeah. Uh, here are a few other guys that I, you know, should we should know, uh, mention Chris Strievler. I mean, yeah, apparently he wasn't even getting any team reps in, in practice. I don't know if the plan was to play him this early or if just the Zach Wilson injury changed things because they didn't want Mike White to get who knows. Um, but he got reps and, he, you know, he, hey, he won that game for the Jets. I thought his athleticism really stood out. Out of all the guys, he's probably the best like Zach Wilson clone. I mean, his competition's Joe Flacco, and Mike White. So clearly not the best athletes in the world. But Strievler was impressive and it wasn't just his legs. He had a few nice throws in there as well. Um, so Strievler looked good to me. The two running backs, uh, Zonovan Knight and Lamichael Pirine. Uh, I think the offensive line, for all the hate that the offensive line depth has gotten, and still, if this if this backup offensive line was going up against starting defensive lines, they'd probably be getting destroyed. But the, the depth in the offensive line, they blocked a lot better um, as the game went on, as they went into facing the Eagles reserves. I'm not act, I'm not going to act like I know too much about the Eagles reserve def- defensive line depth chart. Um, I know they're typically one of the deeper teams in the league. They do prioritize the trenches, but I don't think they are, you know, I have a stellar defensive line uh, unit like the Jets do. A deep one, I should say. They have a, a nice starting group. I thought the offensive line was getting uh, a good amount of push. Nate Herbig, to me, really stood out. I thought Dan Feeney also uh, played pretty well. So I'm pretty happy with the Jets' uh, offensive line depth. Uh, and yeah, that allowed guys like Zonovan Knight and Michael Piran to play well. And, you know, with Knight, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but He's a guy, I think with all the, the, you know, question marks that the Jets have or tough decisions the Jets have, especially if, you know, if Zach's not going to be ready for week one and they have to keep Mike White or whatever, they're going to have to make some tough cuts. I think they only keep three running backs. 
if Nider P. Ryan really keep playing well and Coleman doesn't really play that much at all, I think he had one kickoff return in this game and I don't think he had a single rush. I don't know. Maybe you keep a guy like Zonovan Knight over, over Tevin Coleman. The, the coaching staff seems to love Coleman. I thought Coleman played well in spots last year. So maybe it's a long shot, but just something to keep an eye out. Um, last few guys to, to mention here before we give you, I mean, before we move on, uh, Lawrence Cager. I thought Cager really flashed to me as somebody um, who's intriguing. I think he's probably still more of a practice squad guy. Um, but if, hey, if he puts together a nice game against the Falcons and a nice game against the Giants, He's a guy that I could see sneaking onto the, the roster as the fourth tight end. I mean, I think they're going to keep Baden over, over Wesco. You Ruckert had some good blocks in this game. If they're confident in Baden and, and Wesco or Baden and Ruckert is kind of the backup blocking options at tight end and fullback, you could keep a guy like Cager, who's just kind of a chess piece. And he was significantly faster than the Eagles linebackers. And he made a ton of plays and nice catches. And, you know, even his blocking to me kind of looked, um, you know, looked solid. So he's, he's just one of those guys, one of those developmental guys that, Sometimes you see on other teams, it's like, I've seen that a few times. I think the, uh, I'm trying to remember who exactly um, just converted a receiver to a tight end and it worked out. But sometimes you just see those big physical athletic freaks on other teams. You're like, why do the Jets never do any of those developmental type of guys? And Cage is one of them. It seems to be working out after one game. He's flashed a bit in training camp. Uh, I'll just keep my eyes out on him. Uh, Michael, outside of those guys, any other guys you want to mention um, as guys who stood out to you? Um. Uh, I guess, to be honest, I don't know. I think those are my stars. There are a few other guys we've listed here. Maybe you were a little more impressed than I was. Uh, actually, Will Parks. Will Parks, I'll throw him out there. He's been making noise in uh, training camp quite a bit. And you could just see he plays with a lot of heart, plays hard. He had some good hits in this game. Um, yeah, I think Will Parks stood out. But uh, I think for the most part, we hit on the guys who impressed me the most. Um, but do you have anyone else? No, no love for Sherwood. You didn't, you don't think I see him in big, bold letters on this list, but personally, I just, I actually, you know what? I'm going to shout out his special teams because we did watch all the special teams plays and um, he, we were analyzing some of those and he had some good blocks on kick returns. He made some good tackles in kick coverage. So I will shout that out. I, I don't think a ton stood out to me on defense. He, he did a few he made some good nice plays. Tackles. He did have a few good plays. Uh, now that I think about it. Um, yeah, come on. Maybe didn't shine as much as some of the other players we mentioned, but uh, I, I think he had a good day overall, I guess I'd I, say. I think Sherwood had a nice day. Uh, not like, yeah, not anything stellar, but I think he did a nice job in reserve duty. And you mentioned special teams. Jermaine Johnson, I forgot to mention, he had a really nice block on the, oh, uh, yeah. big, bar- right. on the big Barrios return um, at the start of the game. Uh, yeah, outside of that, I think, yeah, Will Parks is a good one. We'll get to uh, who we might bump off the roster in a second. Uh, and Jordan Whitehead, I thought, briefly, not, not a guy like who flashed a ton, um, but he had that nice deflection in the end zone. And just watching him on the field, I think the Jets have ra- raved about him all summer. Uh, seeing him in pads on the field, he looks a lot bigger. And when they go to those nickel packages and they can bring him in the box, kind of like an extra linebacker, um, he just seems like a fun chess piece for Sala and company to, to use. And um, so just watching him and, and his few reps for the starting defense, I was, I was pretty encouraged. All right, now here comes the negatives. Who are some of the guys that you think either – played poorly or maybe based off somebody else playing well. Now the roster thought is in jeopardy. You started, you just mentioned Will Park. So I'll start uh, and mention a guy like Ashton Davis. I think a guy like Davis is really on the verge of getting losing a, a roster spot. And he's a guy that maybe gets claimed on another 53, but I kind of think he might just slip through the cracks. and The jets can put him on the practice squad. Maybe a team was high on him in 2020 likes his athletic profile, tries to bring him in. I could certainly see it. Um, but it's very clear that Davis is not one of the four best safeties on this team. And the jets have so many tough decisions to make. There's no way they keep five safeties. There's a chance they only keep three, but I think they keep four. And I think it's Joyner, Whitehead, uh, Pinnock and parks. I think Pinnock has showed more in game and in preseason uh, and in practice. So I think those are the four guys Davis to me didn't do anything in particular this game. He had one big completion that was in his area, but that was actually another defensive back we might mention um so yeah i think ashton davis is one of those guys where it's getting close to you know i don't think he's making 53 that's that's my point any other guys that you you want to talk about we got a whole list here um let's see who struggled in this game uh i think offensive line there were a lot of questionable performances um at the starting offensive line i think that's of all the starters they're probably the most critical that the guys i'd be the most critical of 
I think Lakin Tomlinson had some shaky plays. Connor McGovern did have some shaky moments. Um, even AVT, I think, got got a couple times. Jordan Davis got him once for a nice backside tackle. Um, was, so I wasn't too impressed with the first team interior linemen that were out there. Uh, I also don't think Chuma Idoga was very good. Um, he got beaten pretty bad a couple times. So offensive line, a questionable performance. Doesn't necessarily mean that you know, those starting interior guys are going to struggle in the regular season based on a couple of drives in the preseason. But, uh, you know, just for this one night, I don't, I don't think it was their best for uh, the couple of plays they are out there. But um, in addition to that, uh, Bryce Hall, he's a guy who kind of uh, didn't look too good when we saw him while he was out there. Uh, I think you and I blamed him for the first touchdown pass to, yeah. um, to Dallas Goddard. Yeah. Um, not the best job in zone coverage there. Um, so, yeah, I think those are some of the guys who probably stood out as, you know, not playing too well in this game. And then I guess you could look at the defensive line and, you know, just in comparison to some of the guys we mentioned who did play well, you know, Clemens, Zuniga, Smart, you know, these guys were animals today. In comparison to them, I don't think Nate, guys like Nathan Shepard and Jonathan Marshall were as impressive. Um, and then Shepard obviously uh, got – beaten pretty good on that uh touchdown the rushing touchdown by the eagles um and i saw a lot of him getting moved in the run game which is just typical of his film so i'm not i'm not entirely sure why Shepard is on this team to be honest i i'm not a huge fan of his game but um but yeah i guess i would say those are some of the guys who stood out in a bad way uh yeah we have a whole list here of just guys who either stood out in a bad way or Who's roster spot in his jeopardy? Let's just run through him real quick. This guy, actually, I, you could almost put him at stock up, but not from his performance. I put Mike White. I thought Mike White was a little underwhelming. I thought his deep ball accuracy wasn't maybe what you would like to see. I think he still did a nice job of the intermediate stuff. He, look, he drove him down there and got a touchdown. Um, but, you know, after the 400 yard game against the Bengals, I think, and everybody's chanting for him to be the starter. You know, I think you would have liked to see him have a, a better performance. I get, you know, maybe he was a bit shell-shocked getting thrown in there. All of a sudden, Zach Wilson, non-contact, knee injury, all the th thoughts that are going through his head. Um, you know, I, it's a tough position to be thrown into. I thought he, you know, he let him down the field. If, if, if Wilson has to miss week one, or even, you know, the cutdown is August 30th. So Mike White probably makes the roster now guaranteed because by then I don't think the Jets will know for sure if Wilson will be ready for week one. So they probably keep white. So I guess he's a guy whose stock went up, but overall, I just wasn't that impressed. I mentioned Tevin Coleman. I think he's going to have to make some, some nice plays um, this week and next week. Uh, if he wants to, to fight off Zon of a night and Michael P Ryan, I don't think he should be a shoe in um, Denzel Mims and Jeff Smith. Did Jeff Smith play? Do you know? I think he played, right? Yeah, he did. He had some reps. Didn't, didn't do too much. And Mims, Mims did have two nice catches. And then the next drive, he uh, had the penalty and the drop. Uh, and then he also, you could maybe blame him for a special teams play. That was maybe more in Wesco when I was watching it. But, you know, I think Mims is a guy that could certainly be on the trade block. I think Jeff Smith is a guy that his coaching staff clearly likes. So uh, if they keep six receivers, maybe Mims sticks. If they keep five, maybe it's Jeff Smith. Maybe it's just Mims. But I think those two guys are guys who didn't do enough to really help their performance. Uh, especially when you have a guy like, you know, not like Calvin Jackson had like an amazing game, but he's a guy who's had a good camp, did have the touchdown. Who knows? I, I just don't think those guys are, are roster locks. When you look at tight end, I think Wesco and Yaboa um, could have done more to help the, themselves. Uh, not that they did anything particularly bad. Yaboa did have, you pointed out, Michael, had a pretty funny block on a field goal. Like just a yeah. complete <laughs> lack of effort. And I, I'm sure that. I mean, it was just like an exaggerated lack of effort. Like he was the, the edge I guess you'd call him the tackle. I don't know. He's the yeah. furthest out blocker on the extra point. And, you know, he just, he didn't try to block the guy. And then he just kind of like flung his arms out to like emphasize the fact that he didn't. So that, that just stood out. I'm not reading into it too much. Yeah. It was just funny. Okay. That's all. Yeah. It's not too big of a deal. I like you Boa. Um, but I think Cager out of the reserve tight ends fighting for that potential fourth spot uh, certainly impressed me the most and Wesco could maybe stick as the fourth, but if Ruckert's playing well, they like Bowden, maybe they give the nod to Cager, or maybe they only keep three tight ends. Who knows? But it seems like Bowden's beating at Wesco. You touched on the defensive lineman. I think Vinny Curry better get in the field soon because the way Zuniga played, maybe I opt for youth. Maybe I opt for my third-round draft pick over, over Vinny Curry. I know he's a vet. Guys in the locker room like him, but 
I don't know. I don't think he's a, he's a roster lock, and the same goes for Marshall and Shepard, like you said. Um, Ham's a Nazareth team. It's an interesting one that I threw out there. I think that the Jets have a lot of tough decisions to make, and I think that will lead to some surprising cuts. And Hamza is one of those guys to me that we, they, have, they have so many young players that they drafted over the last two years that I think a few are bound to get cut or maybe one or two are bound to get cut just because they haven't done too much. And Hamza, I think, is a perfect guy who could slide right into the practice squad. But in his two years, he hasn't really done anything. And, you know, maybe he makes a play over the next two weeks. I just think he's a guy that shouldn't just be locked into a roster spot. Um, I think Sherwood is probably a lock, but you know, Hey, if Marcel Harris or Delshawn Phillips is giving the jets a better you know, option on special teams or, or, or um, linebacker play, I think they keep, him. I think Delshawn Phillips is, is a good special teamer for the jets better than Hams has been. And so that might lead to him staying instead of Hamza. So who knows? I think that's just one to keep an eye out for that. I could see fans getting mad at, but if he hasn't done too much, you have all these young guys, you're, you're trying to compete. You can't just keep the guys you drafted. Um, you know, you want to keep the best 53. I can see Hamza getting cut and trying to sneak him out of the practice squad. Uh, you mentioned, well, the two corners that I thought uh, Isaiah Dunn, um, not a terrible game. I thought he had a fine game, but he did drop the interception. I think he got beat on another play as well. Uh, and then Gidry, uh, who I think is definitely fighting for a roster spot. I think he can certainly make it still. Um, but he had one really bad play that allowed a, a big gain over the middle. Um, just seems like a miscommunication. So those are all the guys that I feel like their stock went down. Uh, Michael, I don't know if you have any other guys or anything else to expand upon what I said. No, um, I mean, I think your point about Nazar Dean is, is a good one. And just, it applies to all of the, um, not all, but I guess specifically him and Marshall in terms of, you know, recent draft picks who shouldn't necessarily be. And Davis. Uh, and Davis, who shouldn't necessarily be penciled into a roster spot just because of draft pedigree. But um, it, it's because, and, and you mentioned this before you started recording, but it's they've drafted so many players that you can't really just stuff all these players onto your roster and, you know, leave everyone else out because at some point they got to start showing you, giving you a reason to keep them because um, they have so many players under contract through the draft that it's, if you just stuff them all in there, then you're not really going to have space for anyone else. So, um, you know, they're going to have some, tough decisions to make and there are a lot of players who are playing well making cases for roster spots so are you gonna keep guys like Tanzel Smart like Will Parks who are giving you reasons to make the roster are you gonna leave them out because you drafted a guy last year and that's the only thing he has going for him so uh, yeah I think guys like Nazarene like Jonathan Marshall have to step up and start making some plays if they want to completely defend their roster spot right it's a tough business but again look if if hamza gets cut he's either going to get claimed by another team onto their 53 or the jets put him on the practice squad so you know it's not the end of the world i agree though it's like with this season in particular maybe 2020 and last year you can opt to keep the youth the guys you drafted but the jets trying to win games don't get it twisted the jets are trying to win games and you have guys like will parks guys like tanzel smart like you said they're showing out they're proving they're one of the, the 53 best players in this team they have to stay in favor of a guy that was drafted on day three or day two. And you're just trying to shoehorn him in because, you know, because of that, uh, because of that potential. Um, all right. Any last thoughts in this game? When we look at the notes here. Uh, I think we talked about that. We talked, honestly, we talked about all, the, I guess uh, here's one interesting one is the way they use Barrios and like, I guess preseason's not always uh, indicative of how they'll, um, you, you know, use their personnel and formations. But this is kind of the sense I had over the offseason. They gave Barrios the extension. He clearly had a lot of success at the end of last year. So I've been saying on this podcast, like, he's not just the gadget guy. He is the Jets starting slot receiver. He's going to get a lot of run. Yeah, he's going to do the jet sweeps and the, the gadget stuff, but he's not just the kick returner and the guy who comes in every once in a while. I think Barrios is going to have a big role in this offense. He has chemistry with Zach Wilson. And you saw in this in this game, it seems like Barrios and Garrett Wilson – we're splitting reps. Um, and then it was Corey Davis and Elijah Moore. I think as the season goes on, Davis will start to lose reps to Garrett Wilson. And then, you know, it'll be a little bit more even between Davis, Wilson and Barrios, but you know, they had Barrios motioning inside and playing H back. They had him in the slot. They were moving him all over the place. Uh, he's clearly a guy that's going to get a lot of uh, snaps in this offense. Even if people think he's the fourth best receiver on this team, uh, he will be getting snaps like he's the second or third best receiver on this team, just based off based off of two drives <laughs> in the preseason uh, and I guess some training camp footage as well. I just I get the sense that the Jets uh, really want to use him. 
And then I guess the other the other note I had that we haven't talked about for this game was uh, Quinn and Williams. I guess, we kind of briefly talked about him. I thought he had some nice rushes before they took him out. That's that's all. You know, I thought the defensive line as a whole looked good. Um, all right, I think we covered everything from the game. Uh, I touched on the Becton stuff a little bit. Uh, just you know, kind of blaming the not you know you don't want to blame anybody, but casting some shade on the Jets for how they handled Becton last week. Um, they did bring in Dwayne Brown. What are your thoughts on, on Brown and how he fits in with, with George Fant? We don't have any confirmation on who will play where. We'll find that out on Monday. Um, it seems like Brown probably stays at left tackle. They move Fant to right tackle, but who knows? Um, what are your thoughts on Brown and, and how they'll, they'll use him? I think it's a great addition. I, I, think, I think we all agreed he was the best case scenario of how they could rebound from Becton. And they were able to get it done. It was getting a little bit worrisome with how it was being dragged out. But I assume the reason it didn't happen quicker is because the leverage was just stockpiling for Brown and his agent by the day as, you know, Connor McDermott gets hurt, Becton gets hurt. Then you get confirmation on Becton's timetable. So, you know, they were planning to sign him up before all that stuff happened. And as that all those things gradually occurred, it was his price probably just kept going up. So, but either way, the price didn't really matter because it was kind of an essential addition. You can't throw Max Mitchell or Chuma Doga out there. I mean, we're sitting here right now and Max Mitchell has already given up a pressure that led to the quarterback getting injured. Not that the injury is his fault, but just regardless of that. I thought, I thought Mitchell actually had an all right game, to be fair. He did. He did have some good moments, but um, yeah, it's, it's just not ideal. Um, so it was an important addition to make. And I, we'll see how they handle that left side, right side um, conundrum. I think ultimately what's going to happen is Brown is going to stay where he's at on the left side and Fant's going to move back to the right. Um, and I think, you know, it could be a good thing for Fan because imagine he does have another good season and now he can have the uh, ability to say that he's had back-to-back good seasons at two different positions and the type of value that that gives him. Um, I think it could add even more value to his contract uh, that he's potentially looking for from the Jets. So uh, it, it is tough for him, but I think it's the move that he kind of has to make. And I, I think he'll end up doing it. He seems like a team guy. So uh, it, it's tough, but I, I do believe that he can carry over his production from last season to the, to the right side, because I, I really think he improved last season because it was just him hitting his prime in football years as a guy who didn't play football until his final year of college. Um, this is him kind of getting to that prime of his career in terms of football experience, even though he's getting into his thirties. Um, so I really think he would have broken out last season, even at right tackle. I don't know um, if you could say that. He, I, this guy's, He's okay. been so vocal about being more comfortable. That is true. Tackle. That is true. And I think that is the one counterpoint to what I'm saying. But just production-wise, and I'm a numbers person, the production for him before last season, and he had started a lot of games on both sides throughout his career, was pretty even. It really was. And even the pass protection was actually significantly better on the right side. The run blocking kind of helped him balance it out. But – I don't know. I, I think he could have. We'll see how it transpires. Um, I also think, you know, the schedule is a big part of the skepticism of a season last year. He didn't play too many great edge rushers. Right. Um, and playing at right tackle, he probably, he is, I haven't looked at, you know, every single right left edge rusher on their schedule, but generally um, they're the, the schedule of edge rushers that a left tackle will face will be more difficult than a right tackle generally. Uh, and there are a lot of guys who play both sides, so it doesn't really matter. A lot of great edge rushers who play both. Um, but it, his schedule could be a little bit weaker, so it could combat that um, criticism of his season last year. Um, so we'll see how it goes down. It could be a negative. It definitely could be. But I do think there are reasons to believe he can carry it over. Um, and as for Brown, I think he's, based on the way he played last year, I think he can at the least be a league average starting tackle, which is a really good fallback when you lose your starter for the season, I think he can be better than half of the starting left tackles in the league, which is still plenty good for an offensive line that has a lot of pieces. Otherwise um, I think it's a really good way to fall back. And he does, 
I'm going to keep my expectations at that because he's going to be 37 years old. I'm not going to expect more than league average play, but the season before last, he was still playing at an elite level. So an Andrew Whitworth type bounce back where he, you know, shows that he might be declining because he's older, but then actually gets back to being elite, which is what Whitworth did the past couple of years. Um, it's within the realm of possibility, but I think just expect him to be a league average starter in both phases. And that's all the Jets really need. And I think that would be valuable for them to get. You think he's a better run blocker or pass blocker? I think, I think he's pretty similar in both, to be honest. I think he's pretty average in both phases. I think maybe some of the physical, I haven't watched a ton of his film, but I did watch a couple games. I feel like maybe some of the, as you would expect, the physical raw physical ability of his run blocking isn't quite there anymore. That might've made him elite, but he's still, you know, fundamentally sound gets where he needs to get last year. He played in a scheme similar to this one. Um, You know, they're the Seahawks offense coordinator is forget his name, but he was a, yeah. um, First year offense coordinator comes from Sean McVay uh, background, you know, obviously same coaching tree as Michael floor comes from. So similar scheme. One of the most zone heavy teams uh, got some experience there. And then his pass blocking, uh, he did give up a few sacks last year. So there are times where I think, you know, really athletic edge rushers will beat him. But, you know, same thing. I think he has the fundamentals and the hands, um, just the overall technique to be pretty consistent for the most part. But, you know, he will get beat sometimes. So I think he's pretty similar in both phases. Yeah, and not to mention Dwayne Brown was drafted uh, under Gary Kubiak. Kyle Shannon was the offensive coordinator in Houston. It was a long time ago. I think he was drafted like 2008 or something. Uh, Sala was an assistant there, I'm pretty sure. And he has the the, uh, the uh, Richmond, Virginia connection to Joe Douglas. I thought that was kind of yeah. interesting as well. Yeah, I think they'll probably keep him at left tackle. He's 37, 38. Do you really want him changing positions? It's a bummer because I, I do buy into Fant being more comfortable at left tackle. But like you said, I think he, I agree with you that I think he would have made the jump regardless. Um, I think, but I do, I do think he's probably a better left tackle than right tackle. If you just listen to him, I mean, I'll go with his, you know, what he thinks of his, uh, of himself, maybe more so than um, what the numbers might say. He's been very vocal, even when he was initially signed here before the Jets even drafted Becton. You know, he said, I'm excited to play left tackle here. I, I think I'm, I'm more comfortable left tackle. I've just want a chance to be consistent, you know, consistently playing left tackle. Last year's the first chance he got to do that, and he had his best year. So there's cause for concern there. But the, to counteract it, I don't know if you mentioned this, was last year was his best year, and he also played next to AVT. And now AVT's on the right side. He gets to play next to him. I think that's certainly the more athletic side of the Jets' offensive line. Uh, the more mobile, finesse offensive lineman. McGovern is also probably more mobile and finesse. Um, and then on the left side, you got two power punchers. I mean, you got Lake and Tomlinson, who's one of the most powerful guards in the game. And then you got Dwayne Brown, who, like you said, isn't maybe the most physically, uh, imposing guy anymore, but he has heavy hands. He's still a huge guy. Um, athletically he's, he's more limited, but you know, I think Whitworth's a good comparison. It's a guy who played until he was 40 at a super high level. I think, I think Dwayne Brown can give you a year, uh, of, of competency at, at left tackle. I'm curious to see how Fant plays at right tackle. Um, but Bra- running behind Brown and Tomlinson with AVT polling is kind of exciting. I think that'll, that'll be a fun, um, you know, uh, I think that'll be, I think the Jets will be, have, be able to have some fun uh, with the running game, even though they lost back then. I think Brown is a good guy to come in and about as, about as good as what you could hope for a pro bowler guy who's been playing at an elite level, even if he's comes in and he's keeps, to, you know, uh, getting worse. If he's a below average guard or below average left tackle, excuse me, it's still uh, better than the alternative of just running into the season with Chuma Adoga and then a guy, Max Mitchell, who should be having a, more of a red shirt season. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the Beckton news was obviously heartbreaking after this whole scare with Zach Wilson. It feels like that news feels maybe a little bit older. I mean, it is, it's been like almost a week old, um, but I think the jets rebounded as well as they could have with, with Brown and uh, with fan edge. I feel for Makai. I really do. I think it's a, he's a super talented player. I do buy into the fact that I don't think his story is necessarily over. There's a guy who missed one game in college, which was incredibly durable all throughout college. His rookie year, he had the shoulder injury and he kept fighting through it the entire year. And then he gets, you know, GVR gets ragdolled into him and hurts his knee. 
and maybe it's a, a knee injury he never fully recovers from, but now he's getting the full surgery. Uh, I should have done it last year, but hindsight's 2020. I think at that time they were still trying to get him back in the season. Uh, what I read was that it was Makai's team who wanted him to not get the full um, surgery that he's getting now. Who knows? Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I feel for him, but I do think he's a guy that can come back and, and have success. The question is, is you can't really trust him though. So you can't roll into next season with Makai as your pencil in right tackle or left tackle. Um, so you're going to have to bring in somebody to compete against him or who knows, maybe he's battling Max Mitchell. That, that creates a, a problem down the line. But um, as of right now, I just feel for Makai, uh, the person, just because you know, you know how hard he fought to get back on the field and it just really sucks to see that happen. Um, so yeah, Michael, I think, I think that's everything. Looking at our Google doc sheet. Um, you can follow us at CYJ Pod on Twitter. You can follow Michael at Michael and Scornania, myself at Ben W. Blessington. Go to jetsxfactor.com for the best place to go for Jets content. Uh, like, rate, review, subscribe on iTunes, YouTube. Helps us out a ton. Uh, Michael, any last thoughts? Um, we got to talk about that Eagles broadcast. Yes, yes, that I was, forgot. That was tough. Of all the things we dealt with, this was the toughest, I think. To listen to these, I've listened to a lot of biased broadcasts throughout the years, you know, streaming Jets preseason games. You know, they don't always put the Jets broadcast on Game Pass. So sometimes you see whether it was Falcons a few years ago or Giants or whatever. I've seen a lot of different teams. And obviously these broadcasts are geared towards one specific team, whoever's in that local market. But this was as one-sided of a broadcast as I've ever heard in any sport. Yeah, no, it was bad. And I think that's always the worst part about preseason for anybody who doesn't live uh, in the New York area is you, you go on game pass. You hope it's the Jets broadcast. It feels like it never is. It's, it feels like it's – so I've seen, you know, Washington broadcasts, Saints broadcasts, I mean, Falcons broadcasts. I'm trying to think. Other preseason match, a Panther. Like I've seen all sorts of different uh, opposing teams, you know, uh, own in-house broadcasting team. And this was easily the worst. Uh, no offense. I mean, I think the play-by-play -play guy is good. I'm sure if I was an Eagles fan, I'd love Ross Tucker. But as a Jets fan, watching uh, two touchdown drives given up by your uh, your starting defense, a pick, near pick six by your starting quarterback, and a season a potential season-ending injury in the first four drives, and then having to listen to Ross Tucker talk about how he's an open-toe shoe connoisseur, or he gets his <laughs> Chipotle bowl with carnitas, is how he pronounced it, where they're doing the wave. Or if you don't like preseason football, I'm going to punch you in the face. I think the most <laughs> ridiculous one was at the penalty that they called on uh, Mylotta on Bryce Huff, where he just completely tackles Bryce Huff to the ground and, and Hertz takes the open hole and runs it in for a wide open touchdown. He's like, you know, I attended a meeting this week and that that's light. I mean, that didn't even affect the play. That should have been called. And then he goes back to it the next drive when there's a, a clear hold or he thinks there's a clear hold on a Doga. I mean, just, I'm sorry. He was just terrible. He was awful. He sounded like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to keep ragging on him, but I don't know. No, I mean, if you're, if you're an Eagles fan, I'm sure this was a blast to listen to. And that, and that's his job, you know, is to hype up Eagles fans, not Jets fans. So in that respect, like he did a really good job objectively, but we are the unfortunate victim. No, no, he victim. didn't. No, okay. he didn't. No, you he don't didn't. think Eagles he fans didn't. enjoyed that? I'm sure Eagles fans did, but that doesn't mean he did a good job. I've uh, My point of listening to all these different away broadcasts is your job is to, yeah, be a bit of a homer. You're playing up your team. Um, but I st there was still no objective analysis about what the Eagles were doing well and not well, what the Jets were doing well and not well. Like, you can still have an Eagle slanted broadcast where you're talking about Jordan Davis and Cam Jurgens and whoever else you wanted to well, watch myself and, and be nice about in that broadcast. But zero acknowledgement of any jets players yeah. the jets starting quarterback yeah. it's the entire game like the biggest storyline of that game was zach wilson potentially tearing his acl they talked about it for eight seconds and moved on to oh jerk it off with Cam it, it was like um so the play-by-play -play guy brought it up he's like so it looks like you know just no contact a little tweak there and he tosses it over to ross tucker and he's like yeah well anyway look at jordan davis here yeah, i just <laughs> like it, nothing sums it up it was better awful. than that it was I, I mean i was just trying to give him some credit because I don't want to be too harsh and I get that it's, you know, a biased broadcast, but like they weren't even acknowledging the existence of Jets players. Like there were probably three or four times throughout the game where they actually mentioned who the Jets player in the play was, like who caught the pass 
or who made the tackle. It was just, I think, and also there should be some understanding that a lot of people are streaming these games around the country who are fans of the other teams and that you're probably going to be, you know, having some viewers who aren't Eagles fans and just, it it should be a regular broadcast with, you know, slight slant to the home team, not just a total Kool-Aid fest. Yeah, no, you're right. It was extreme, but that part to me is not even what was so annoying about it. It was just all the other bullshit that was going on in the broadcast. <laughs> That's honestly to me, it was just, it was just so, I don't know. I, I'll, I feel like we'll get ourselves in trouble if we keep talking about it, but yeah, I just, uh, he was just a terrible, terrible. It was the, it was just rubbing salt in the wound of, I was getting annoyed. Oh, I was, I was in a bad mood at the start of the game. Um, and then Michael's texting me after the first drive that we suck <laughs> and that the season's over and that nothing good will ever happen. And then Zach throws the interception. And so, so I'm just in a bad mood. And then Zach, then I'm reading Twitter saying Zach's tearing his ACL because people are just jumping the gun and trying to get clout. And then I'm listening to this dude who just sounds like every drunk uncle at a barbecue who knows nothing of what he's talking about. And just, I'm sorry. I just, I hate, I, it was, I'm sorry, Ross Tucker, but listening to you last night was absolutely brutal. And mostly, it was honestly, if he didn't have the line about the penalty, I could put up with it. But the whole thing with the penalty, and he kept going back to it, how that hold didn't affect the play when Mylotta literally just tackles Bryce Huff and Hurts just runs right in for a touchdown. I was like, what do you mean that didn't affect the play? A hold could not possibly affect the play any more than that did. <laughs> so, I don't know. It's whatever. We'll move on. Um, all right. I guess that's it. Sorry the, the, to end the show with the Ross Tucker, shitting on Ross Tucker segment, but I think it was, it was much needed uh knock michael you have you have wood nearby you yeah knock him wood everything comes back positive uh with uh with zach that he only misses two to four weeks hopefully he's ready for the opener i think we're preparing for the, the possibility that he might not be that's okay a hell of a lot better than a season ending injury and what that would have done uh for the jet season but hopefully he doesn't have to miss too much time if he does have to miss a, a few weeks at the beginning of the season obviously that sucks but it is a long season and the jets still have plenty of guys to develop and they have a competent backup quarterback so you know things are still bright uh and the jets got a win you know didn't feel like it felt like they were down 50 points last night and then all of a sudden they won but they did get a win they battled back the backups played well you know starters had some work to do zach wilson didn't look too good the injury was scary but all in all michael what a roller coaster last night was and hopefully not too indicative of what the season will look like um but Good reminder for Jets fans that anything can happen at any moment and God hates you. So with that being said, everybody have a great week. Go Jets.